Hello, my name is Frank Hiley, and I'm going to be explaining multiple forms of conscious awareness and more, I hope a lot more. And I am writing a book, and the tentative title of the book is Spirituality Explained, but it's still a, a year or two away. It's not uh, anywhere near done yet. I keep coming up with new ideas, so I, I'm glad I didn't write it before now. Anyway, here's a list of the different kinds of conscious awarenesses that I will explain here. And in addition to that, I will also talk about how spirituality developed and how its invention changed consciousness. Now, I'm going to also look at a number of, of um, questions about consciousness that I'm going to answer at the end of the talk. So if you could think about what my answer might be, see if you can figure it out before we get to the end of the talk here. The first question will be, why does conscious awareness seem to be fundamentally non-physical and to not have a location in space? What conditions cause conscious awareness to arise? Can conscious awareness exist without a self? And do humans have free will? Now here's the outline of the talk, and there's quite a few topics that we're going to cover. So let's just dig in and start with the description of agents and world models. Now the definition of an agent is that an agent is an entity that has goals, has a way of sensing the world, and has a way of making changes to the world to achieve those goals. So that by, by that definition, human beings are agents. So there's a control system theorem from 1970 that says that every good regulator of a system must be a model of that system. That means that a good agent needs a model of the world. Now, presumably, humans are good agents because we can achieve our goals that pretty well, and that means that we need to have a model of the world contained in our brain. Now, if the agent is part of the world that the agent is trying to, to achieve its goals in, such as human beings being part of this physical world here, then the agent will also need to have a model of itself in that world. So a human will have to have a model of the, self, of the body of the human in the world that the human is act, interacting with. And that self, that'll be called a self-model. It's the model of the agent itself in the world that it's interacting with. So humans will need to have a model of the world and will need to have a self-model of who we are in that world. Now, the question is, do we experience the world directly or do we only experience our model of the world? Colors can help answer that question. Now, the way colors work is that the eye has three different kinds of photoreceptors, and, that, and the information that the eye sends to the brain is equivalent to having three black and white images taken in each of these three different colors. And then the brain takes those three images and combines them to produce this. The colors that you can see in that colorful image there don't exist out in the world. The, 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 the colors are constructed by the brain to help us interpret the world. Now, some people object, yeah, but the colors correspond to the wavelength of light, so it's telling you something about the world, the color that you see. And that's not true also. And we can, we can see that by looking at Edwin Land's two-color discovery. Edwin Land is the person that invented the Polaroid instant camera. And he was doing an experiment with three black and white images, similar to the uh, images that you saw on the previous slide. And these would have been um, slides that were transparent. And he was projecting red light, green light, and blue light through those three slides onto a screen. And when you do that, you get a full color image like that there. Now, he was taking his equipment apart one day, and he had turned off the blue projector. And he had also taken the green filter out of the green projector. So he had a setup like this. So don't you think that he should have seen some combination of red, white, and black on, this, on the display, since he was only projecting red light, white light, and then no light if, if neither projector was projecting on a particular region? Maybe something like this image here, kind of a reddish bird. Well, what he actually saw was more like this image right here. Now, there was, there was greens and yellows and oranges and colors that shouldn't be there because they, they didn't come from the two projectors. Now, it wasn't a fully saturated image like this. The fully saturated image with all three colors gives you a better image. But there were definitely colors that shouldn't have been there if we're only seeing the wavelengths of light. So the, the brain is somehow constructing these extra colors out of the information that it gets. Now, I could only approximate these images here because I would have had to have a setup with two projectors, and uh, instead of doing it, I just fudged that. But here's an illusion that you can see right here in this room. So the two, the two squares there, do those look like the same color of green to you? They don't to me. And they actually look a little different on my computer screen than up on the projector up there. But the, they are actually the same color. And yet if you erase the overlying purple and orange bars going over those squares, you can see that they're the same color. That's all I did was erase the bars. I didn't do anything else. No tricks up my sleeve here. 
the red, green, blue values of those bars are shown there. These RGB values go from 0 to 255. So put those back. I wanted to see how different those color experiences were there. So I, I drew a large border around those squares, and I tried to, tried to make the color of the border match the color that I experienced in the square there. Does that look like it matches for you there? OK, well, to me, it looked like it matched. So if I take away the original image and fill in those rectangles, then I can compare the color of those rectangles to the original color. And the left color is about 100 points higher in green than the original color. And the right color is about 100 points higher than red in the, than the, in the original color. So that, that illusion there was caused by those overlying bars that somehow caused your brain to experience a different color there. So you really are not experiencing the wavelength of light when you experience color out there in the world. There is a correlation between them, but it's not the same. Okay, there's another example where our experience doesn't agree with, what the, what, with the information that our eyes are sending to the brain. And that comes from the fact that our peripheral visual acuity drops off rapidly from the center of vision. If you have 20-20 vision in the center of vision here, you go out about 10 degrees and it's down to 20-40, which means that you couldn't drive legally. And if you go out further than that, it, it, you, you become legally blind near the periphery. And then there's also the blind spot. Each eye has a blind spot. Now, when we are looking out at the world, we see something like this. If you keep your eyes on that center green cross there, that center house looks like it's in focus and sharp. The houses around it also look like they're in focus and sharp. It doesn't look like they're getting blurrier and blurrier the further you get away. And if you look over at my, well, don't look at my face. Keep your eye on that green spot. You can still see my space over here on the edge. Now, what the eye is sending to the brain is something more like this. It, it's blurry, and then there's the blind spot. Now, the blind spot in each eye is in different locations, but even if you close one of your eyes, you don't see the blind spot. And the reason why you don't see what your eye is sending to your brain is because you are seeing the world model that the brain is constructing. What we experience is the world model. And the brain knows that the periphery of our visual area here isn't, isn't blurry. It knows that the periphery is sharp and in focus. So it only gives you the experience of sharp and in focus a house is all the way out to the edge. Another example comes from rapid eye saccades. This is where you quickly move your eye from one fixation point to another. And if you, move the, if you do that right now, if you fixate on different things in this room, does it look like the room is moving? No, it doesn't. The, the room seems perfectly stationary, even though the image that's appearing on your retina is shifting by large amounts back and forth. So the, the room is stationary, even though your eyes are shifting around and the images are, are changing dramatically. The other thing is that you are momentarily blind during the time when your eye is moving there, and you do not experience that blindness. Now, you can go home and experience it yourself. If you get up close to your bathroom mirror and look first at your left eye and then your right eye and switch back and forth rapidly, you will notice that the, you never see the eyes moving. Even though your eyes obviously have to be moving back and forth, you will never see them moving if you do that in your bathroom mirror at home. Now, if you want to see your eyes moving, Use your cell phone and use the front-facing camera and hold it up close to your face like a camera, like a mirror. And then you will see a little bit of the eye motion because there's a delay in the processing of the, of the cell phone. So the image that you're going to see there is going to be slightly delayed. and You'll catch the end of the eye movement during the saccade. There'll still be a blank where you won't see it moving, but you'll catch the end of the movement. So all this means is that the, you, you are not experiencing the actual sensory information coming from your senses. You're experiencing the model of the world that the brain constructs, and it does a whole lot of processing to cover up all the defects that come from the various senses. And this applies to all the senses, not just the visual. For example, if you're listening to a symphony and you hear this beautiful music and you, know, you can just experience that yourself, that, ex that experience of beauty comes from your brain. It doesn't come from the music. The, the wavelength of the, of the light, the sound, of, you know, the frequency of the, of the sound and all that is not a beautiful thing at all. The beauty comes entirely from inside of your brain. So everything that we experience, even the bodily senses, are, are the same thing. So the bottom line is that we are self-models living in and experiencing our model of the world. Now, I'm a physicist, so I believe there is a, there is a real physical world out there. But the world that we live in every day is the model of the world created by our brain. Now I'm going to look at the three-agent model. And the three-agent model of the human brain has, has three agents. And the first agent is the thinker. And the thinker is the general problem solver. The doer is the agent that controls the body. And then the experiencer is the agent that creates the world model that the thinker and the doer use. 
according to the good regulator theorem, we have to have a world model, and this is, the, this is what the experiencer does. It creates the world model. Now, the thinker plans non-automatic, thoughtful behaviors and thoughtful speech, and it also produces the inner voice and inner visualizations that we experience. If you're wondering about what inner voice are we talking about here, that's it, the one that's wondering what, what inner voice are we talking about here. <laughs> now, the doer produces all the automatic behaviors of the body, and it also implements the thinker's thoughtful behaviors and thoughtful speech, because the thinker doesn't directly control the body. All the control of the body goes to the doer. And the doer also produces emotions and feelings. Now, given the thinker and the doer, the experiencer is required by the good regulator theorem. And what the experiencer does is it, it builds up a sensory model of the world. It takes all the sensory information coming in, and it builds up a model of the world based on that sensory information. And it also takes all the abstract concepts that come in through language, and it builds up an abstract conceptual world that we live in. And humans live very a lot in the abstract conceptual world, especially people, people at universities like Stanford here. You're living in that ab abstract conceptual world quite a bit. And then the other thing that the experiencer does is to direct attention appropriately. Now, the evidence for the thinker and the doer is that they are consistent with experimentally derived, well-established models of cognition in two different fields. In the field of psychology, it's consistent with dual process theory. Dual process theory is, was popularized by Daniel Kahneman in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. That the fast process is one of those two processes, and the slow is the other one. Now, in dual process theory and psychology, they call these two systems system one and system two. I basically have just renamed system two to be the thinker and system one to be the doer. So according to dual process theory, the difference between the thinker and the doer is that the thinker is slow and sequential, the doer is fast and parallel. The thinker is deliberative and controlled, the doer is intuitive and automatic. And the thinker is based on explicit knowledge and, and conscious, and the doer is based on, on implicit knowledge and it's unconscious. So that's the dual process theory. That's the evidence from, from psychology. The other, the other field is neuroscience. In the field of neuroscience, there's a model called the out, action outcome stimulus response model. Now, the thinker corresponds to the action outcome contingency system. And what action outcome contingency means is that the brain tries to figure out what action will produce the outcome that I want. So that's problem solving. It's trying to solve the problem of what action should I do to get the outcome that I want. The doer is the stimulus re response habit system. That's the automatic behaviors that we learn. And in fact, neuroscience has been able to show how the action outcome system eventually teaches the stimulus response system what to do. If you repeat the same action over and over again with the action outcome system, eventually the, system response, the, the stimulus response system learns that, and you don't have to go through the work of computing that, that action. Now, the thinker uses the associative network part of the brain, and the doer uses the sensory motor network of the brain. So let's look at the major connections between the agents. I have a diagram for that here. So all the inputs are on the left, and all the outputs are on the right. The sensory motor network connection between the experiencer and the doer is shown by this fast and wide interface here. That's what makes this part of the sensory motor network, that those two are connected by a fast and wide interface. Now, dual process theory says that the thinker is slow and sequential, and that's why the thinker has a slow interface to the experiencer. Now, the experiencer builds up the sensory world model by taking the sensory input and understanding the sensory input. What it does is it, it tries to figure out how do I have to change the world model to take into account this new sensory input that I've got. And that's, that's called understanding that sensory input. Similarly, the experiencer takes in the language input and it updates the abstract conceptual model of the world. And again, it's trying to understand what is said in this. And you know, when your teacher is teaching you something, you're sitting there trying to figure out what he's saying and how does that fit into my world model and how do I have to change my world model to make that true. That's understanding it. And then the experiencer also directs attention. And the experiencer also includes intuition. My definition of intuition is that intuition is understanding what to do in the world without thinking. So if you have to think about it, then you're using the thinker to figure out how the world works. But if you just intuitively know how it works, that's intuition at work. In addition to that, the experiencer needs to know about the goals of all the agents. And I'll disclose why in a, in a few minutes. And the other thing it needs to have is the self-models of all the agents. So for example, the model of the body is included in the model of the world, and the, any other model of these three agents needs to be included in this experiencer's model, world model. 
Now the thinker is the problem solver and it produces the thoughtful speech and thoughtful behavior. And the thinker also produces the inner voice and inner visualizations. The doer produces the automatic speech and automatic behavior. And then it also produces the feelings and emotions that, that go over to the experiencer. So here are some other connections between the agents. Now there's two kinds of attention. There's top-down attention. This is where the thinker and the doer tell the experiencer where it should pay attention to, what it should pay attention to in the world. And then there's bottom-up attention where the experiencer on its own figures out what's important to the thinker and doer and brings that to the attention of the thinker and doer. And there's two ways there. For example, if something happens in the world that's unexpected, like if there was a sudden loud clap in the back of the, of the room, that would get all of your bottom-up attentions going because your thinker and doer might have to do something about that. The other thing that happens is if, for example, I have a, a, if my doer has a goal of eating ice cream and somebody goes and puts down an ice cream next to me, my doer will be notified that there's ice cream sitting next to me so my doer can go and pick it up and eat it. So the, the goal objects that the, that the agents have are also part of what uh, gives, causes bottom-up attention. And then the inner voice and visualizations are created by the thinker, but they're experienced by the experiencer. The feelings and emotions are created by the doer, but they're experienced by the experiencer. And the doer has to tell the experiencer about any planned motor, motor actions, at any time that the, the, the body is going to be moved, because that's going to change the sensory experience that's going to come into the body. And the, and the experiencer needs to know if it's due to the motion of the body or if the world itself is changing. Now we're going to look at the goals of the agents. And the, one of the major sources of goals is evolution. And in fact, the evolution has given the doer lots and lots of goals. The, the doer has, the three main categories of goals that the doer has are to survive, to reproduce, and to be social, because we're social animals, so it has a lot of goals that are to be social. Now, those are the major categories, but there's hundreds of little sub-goals like there. To survive, I need to get water, food, shelter, stay warm, you know, all that kind of stuff. There's all kinds of goals that are built into the doer. Now, the only goal built into the thinker is to solve problems. The reason why it only has one goal like that is because it's meant to handle the situations that the doer can't handle. So the thinker will figure out how to survive in a situation where the instinctual goals of the doer doesn't help it. And then the experiencer has a couple of goals. It has a goal of building the best possible model of the world and then also directing attention for the, for the, experiencer, for the thinker and the doer. Now, another way that goals get created is by creating goals. The, the, for example, I early on in childhood somewhere, I created the goal that I must always be right. <laughs> so if somebody said I was wrong, I would argue with them and convince them that they were wrong and that I was right. Now, another goal that I created in high school was that I wanted to become a physicist. Now, to become a physicist, I had to create a lot of sub-goals, too. I had to go, out, go to the library and read a lot of books, and I had to, to uh, take the courses in high school that I needed and then find a good college to go to and take the courses I needed there and then go to a graduate school out here at Stanford. And all those sub-goals were created out of that main goal of becoming a physicist. And then there's copying. For example, my doer apparently copied my goal that I must always be right. And the doer's way of, of enforcing that goal is by getting angry at somebody if they said I was wrong. So if I can't convince them with argument, maybe I'll convince them with anger. Um, so and the other, the, another example is the, um, the doer has all the pro-social goals built into it. The thinker can copy those pro-social goals and try to be a good, a good social being also. But the thinker is not as good at that. The thinker is more selfish and self-centered, and that's not a good way to be social. OK, now I'm going to talk about the self-models of the agents. And before I talk about the, the self-models, I have some definitions. I mean my is the name I've given to a concept. And this concept is probably the largest concept in your brain. It's the conceptual autobiographical narrative history of me and all of my goals and my everything that I know about me is all included in this I mean my concept. Plus it has a simple body model. Then there's the body schema. And the word schema is used in neuroscience when it's a model of something. So this is the model of the body. It's not the physical body itself. This is the brain's model of the body. One of the best ways to know about body schemas is when they are different from the actual physical body. For example, people who have had a limb amputated but they have, still have a phantom limb, that's their body schema, still has that limb there even though it's been actually surgically amputated. 
Um, another, another example is the rubber hand experiment. Have you seen that where the experimenter hides the hand behind a, a, a partition and they put a rubber hand there and it makes it look like it's part of your body. And you can see the experimenter stroke the rubber hand and at the same time behind the partition he's stroking your real hand. After a few minutes of that, your body schema has now incorporated this rubber hand as being your, the hand of your body. It thinks that that's your hand. So if somebody comes up with a knife, you can get very excited and, and you know, jump away because that's your hand they're trying to, to stab there. Go, go look, at, look at some of those videos on YouTube. So that's the body schema. And then there's the attention schema. And again, this is a model of attention. Now the brain has some neurological mechanism of, of neurons firing that causes it to pay attention to a particular object. That's not what this is. The attention schema is the model of what that neurological mechanism is doing, just like the body schema is the model of the body. Okay? And there are, there are cases where the attention schema and the, and the actual attention mecha mechanism can get out of sync, and that's other evidence for this attention schema. All right, now remember that a self-model is needed if, if the agent is in the world that is trying to control. Well, the thinker is mostly working in the conceptual world, and the conceptual model of the self in the, is the I, me, my concept that I described before. So the thinker self-model is the I, me, my concept. The doer controls the body, so the doer self-model is the body schema. Now, you might think the experiencer doesn't need a self-model because it doesn't exist out here in the world. It doesn't interact with the world. But I'll show you in a few slides that it does need a, a, a self-model, and the self-model is the attention schema. So I'll show you how that, why that's true now. So start with worlds and world models. Now, the, the world that you see here, these, these houses have colors, so they must be my world model, remember? They're not the physical world out there. This is the world model. And when you direct attention around the world, the world doesn't change. Like when you move your eyes around this world here, the world itself doesn't change. Similarly, you can keep your eye on the center house there, and it's possible to direct peripheral visual attention to one house on the left or one house on the right without moving your eyes. You have to keep your eyes on one house and see if you can pay attention to the details of one house or the other house. So for example, put attention to that house and then pay attention to that house and back to the center house. When you did that peripheral visual attention, did the world change? No. What did change is what I call the current representation of the world. The current representation of the world has extra information available wherever the, the uh, attention is being directed. So when you're looking at that center house, you've got more information available there because you have better visual acuity there than you have at the houses around there. Then you direct peripheral attention to there, you got more information available there, and then back to there, you have more information on the left, and then back to the center. So if you look at these three objects, we have the world model, the attention schema, and the current representation of the world. All three of these objects are created by the experiencer continuously, and they're updated by the experiencer. The world model only changes when the world changes, but the, the attention schema changes when the experiencer is directing attention around in the world and the current representation of the world tracks what information is available to the, to the agents. So if you call these three objects here together the complete world object, then what the experiencer does in this complete world object is direct attention. And therefore, the model of the experiencer is the attention schema. And this is why the attention schema is required, and it's the model of the experiencer um, in this complete world object. Now let's look at attention schema theory. Attention schema theory was developed by Princeton neuroscientist Michael Graziano. And what attention schema theory says is that the attention schema is a model of awareness. And in particular, an agent's model of awareness would be the self-model of the agent plus the attention schema plus the current representation of the world. So that's the details about the object that you're looking at with your attention. So for the thinker, the thinker would translate this into say, I am aware of the house if you were looking at a house. So remember now, what, what attention schema is saying is that the attention schema is awareness. And we said that the attention schema is the experience or self-model. So let's fill out the table of self-models for the agents. We already know that the thinker self-model is I, me, my, the doer self-model is the body schema, the experience or self-model is the attention schema, and attention schema theory says that that's also awareness. So now we have the model of all three agents. Now think about that. Anytime that you experience awareness of something out in the world, the redness of red, the, color, the roundness of an apple, any experience that you have there, that, that, that awareness that you have there is an experience of your experiencer's attention schema. You're actually aware of your attention schema all the time. Whenever you're aware of anything, you're aware of the attention schema according to attention schema theory. 
And then finally, the human would have some combination of these three subagent self models. And we'll talk a lot more about that later. Now let's go back to attention schema theory. It says that an agent must have an attention schema in order to be conscious, but of these three agents, only the, only the experiencer has an attention schema. Therefore, according to attention schema theory, only the experience would be conscious all by itself. So if we want to create multiple conscious agents, we have to combine them with the experiencer. So for example, the doer consciousness is the doer plus the experiencer. The thinker consciousness is the thinker plus the experiencer. And finally, the, the human as a whole would be some combination of the experiencer, doer, and thinker consciousness combined. So that's how we can create models, agents that have consciousness by combining them with the experiencer. Now let's look at agent awareness models for the different kinds of agents using attention schema theory. Now this is what we have, this, the self model plus the attention schema plus whatever object you're aware of. So I'm looking at objects, concepts, and the self. So for the self, it's the self model aware of the self model. Now attention schema theory says that all those attention schemas there are actually awareness. So self model aware of object. Now the understanding of the, the awareness of a concept I claim is really an understanding of the concept. Now it's not the complete deep understanding of the concept, it's the surface recognition that it is a concept. For example, if I mention the term differential equations, probably most people in this room will know that differential equations are something about math. You may not know anything more than that, but you, un you understand that it's something about math. That's the understanding I'm talking about. Now, if you really need to understand differential equations to solve them for physics problems, you have to take several courses, and it takes a lot longer to understand them at that deep level. But this is the surface level of understanding. So let's look at the thinker's awareness models. So there's where you plug them all in, and you end up with, I am aware of the object, I understand the concept, and I am aware of me. The doer's awareness models would be body schema aware object. And I put these in square brackets here because these are the sensory experiences of, of the body being aware of the object. These are what the, the philosophers call the qualia, the, 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 the sensory experience, what it's like to experience red, that feeling of what it's like to be experienced red. That's what this is talking about here, the doers having qualia of objects, of, of concepts, and of the body. Now let's look at the experiencer awareness models. Now the experiencer's self model is the attention schema, but the attention schema is awareness. So you end up with lots of awarenesses here, but all the awarenesses are either pointing to objects, to concepts, or to awareness itself. So there's a lot of redundant awareness objects here. If we take them out, you're left with a selfless awareness of an object, because there's no self in this, in this system here. There's no self in that self model uh, uh, slot, or the the, the selfless understanding of a concept, or the selfless, locationless, objectless un awareness of awareness itself. So you're being aware of awareness, and there's no self, there's no location, and there's no object in that awareness of awareness. Now that awareness of awareness could also be expressed as being a sense of presence, and that's a selfless, locationless, non-physical existence, because you're just aware of the fact that you have awareness itself. So that's presence. Now let's go back to the complete world object. This is, this is indeed the complete world if we only had top-down attention in the world. So for example, the thinker and the doer use this attention schema plus the current representation of the world to go out and do whatever they're going to do in the world. That's all that they use is they use the, those two parts of it. The, the other thing is that the experiencer can also use this attention schema and this current representation of the world. And that's where it, it has that selfless awareness of the world. If it, if the, experiencer uses this attention schema and current representation of the world. Now to do bottom-up attention, the experiencer needs an additional object, and I call it the experiencer's awareness schema. And that ball with a whole bunch of arrows sticking out of it is meant to represent that the experiencer has to actually pay attention to the ex entire world model. It has to pay attention to everything in the world model all the time because it has to be aware if something has happened that is not expected or it has to be aware that there's a goal object around. And when it becomes aware of something like that, then some part of the, the experiencer's um, attention schema will break off and become an attention schema, and that's how the thinker and the doer get notified that something has changed in the world that they gotta pay attention to. So that's the way bottom-up attention converts from being aware of the entire world to uh, giving that, uh, the awareness to the thinker and the doer. 
the fact that the experiencer has to be aware of the entire world all the time, that's what gives us the apparent awareness of the entire world. For example, when you're looking at my face right here, you're aware of the, all the rest of the peripheral visual world around you here. You, you can't say a lot about it, but you're aware of it. That's your experience or being aware of all the rest of the world model that you're not really paying attention to. So what you're paying attention to, that gets shipped off to the thinker and doer to do what they're going to do with it. But the experiencer is always aware of the entire world model. That's why we have this rich world experience out in front of us here. And it also applies to the body. We're aware of the body at that level of just being aware of the body um, all the time, the experiencer is. When, when the experiencer is aware of the entire world, this is also a selfless awareness, and we're going to see that in a couple of slides. So it's using this EAS object in the world model the same way that the, the attention schema and the current representation of the world is used by the other agents. Now more about this experiencer attention schema object. First of all, the EAS has to be both an underlying neurological mechanism. There is a neurological mechanism in the brain that is somehow paying attention to the entire world. And it also has to have a model of, of that mechanism. Because when that arrow breaks off and goes over to the attention schema, that's a part of the experiencer's world model. The, the experiencer's attention schema has to break off and become part of the attention schema object. So it has to be both a mechanism and a model. That's what makes it analogous to the attention schema. There's the, the attention mechanism in the brain, and then there's the model of the attention, and that's called the attention schema. So the experiencer attention schema has to also have both a mechanism and a, a model. And all those arrows determine all possible conscious awareness targets. For example, you know, we're not aware of everything that's going on in our body. There is an entire enteric brain here in our stomach that has you know, as much neurons as a dog's brain has. And there's a cerebellum which has like half of the neurons of the brain are in the cerebellum. We have no awareness of what those things are doing. That's because there's none of those little arrows that, that experiencer attention schema are pointing to those objects in the brain. It's only pointing to the sensory areas and to the thoughts and things like that. Next, I'm going to look at the NYU philosopher Ned Block's proposal of the distinction between Phenomenal consciousness and access consciousness. Now, phenomenal consciousness is supposed to be the qualia, the experience of being aware of something. It's that, that sensory experience of the redness of red would be a qualia. And an example is your peripheral visual attention. Now, the, the access consciousness is the part of consciousness that's available for use for reasoning and for guiding speech and action. Now, the thinker and the doer are the only agents that reason, speak, and act in the world. They're the ones that have the interaction with the world and can reason about the world. So the access consciousness is used by those, by those two agents. So there are four kinds of conscious awareness. Let's see which of them have access consciousness and which of them have phenomenal consciousness. Now, the thinker and the doer have to have the access consciousness because those are the agents that reason, speak, and act in the world. I also claim that the experiencer consciousness has to have a kind of access consciousness. It's not interacting with the world here. What it's doing is it's updating the world model based on the sensory information coming in. So it has to pay attention to that sensory information and update the world model. So it has to work with that information. So it has a kind of access consciousness. Now over on the phenomenal consciousness side, the doer and the experiencer and the world model awareness all have that phenomenal consciousness of sensory information. Now, if, the, if a thinker is only working in the world of concepts, then it does not have phenomenal consciousness. So the thinker does not have phenomenal consciousness. And I claim that the world model awareness doesn't have access consciousness. And you can actually experience that yourself right here. If you keep your eyes focused on my face here and pick some other object in the room up to the side of that, if you want to say anything about that object, like what color it is or what kind of object it is, or if you want to name any attribute of that object, you're going to have to try to do some peripheral visual attention directed over to that object to see if you can exp experience some of that, uh, what that object is, is doing there. And that's the access consciousness. That peripheral visual attention is access consciousness. So the actual world model awareness doesn't give you that. You have to use the attention schema to get that. Okay, so we'll put those labels into the uh, complete world object, the, the, the experiencers, um, world model awareness is only phenomenal consciousness, whereas the attention schema and the current representation of the world can either be phenomenal or access consciousness. Now I'm going to look at the world model awareness of the experiencer here. So we're going to use the, ex the experiencer's attention schema and the self model and the object. And the, the only objects that I'm looking at here 
are the, the world model, the experiencer being aware of the entire world model and the experiencer being aware of itself. So that's what I'm trying to come up here. Now the self model again is gonna be the EAS. So again, all these EASs point to a world model. These three AS, EASs in the bottom row there have to also point to a world model. So even though it's not mentioned explicitly, implicitly there has to be a world model there also. If you get rid of the redundant ones, you end up with just awareness of the world. And this is a selfless awareness of the world in both cases. Even though in the bottom case, you're trying to experience the experiencer itself. So any attempt of trying to experience the experiencer ends up just experiencing the world model. This could be why the, the non-dual people claim that they experience that the world and I are one. Because trying to experience the experiencer ends up giving you an experience of the world. So you could say that the experiencer is the world model to a certain extent here. You say the experiencer is the world model. Now I'm gonna define a term that I call fundamental consciousness. And fundamental consciousness includes the experiencer's selfless world model awareness on the left here, and then it's the experiencer's selfless object awareness on the right. The two of those together give you what I call fundamental consciousness. And it's fundamental consciousness because if you add a thinker to this, you end up with thinker consciousness. If you add a doer to this, you end up with doer consciousness. But this is the basis on which all other kinds of consciousness come. All right, now I'm gonna talk about possible human self models. And the human, basically I view it as being three slots where there's a certain amount of thinker, a certain amount of doer, and a certain amount of experiencer in, in the human self model. Now, I claim that, that primitive animals would be mostly identifying with a doer. Now, all animals have a thinker, but they aren't very powerful in the lower, lower animals. They become more and more powerful as you go up to primates and to humans. But all animals have a thinker, but they identify with the doer. Now, I do claim that primates, dolphins, and elephants do have a significant amount of thinker self-model built in there. And the reason for that is that these are the animals that can pass the mirror self-recognition test. Is everybody here familiar with that test? So this is where if you put some paint on the forehead and you show them a mirror, only these animals will try to rub the paint off their forehead. Other animals have no concept that that's me. And you need to have a conceptual self and a conceptual uh, model of other people. And that's what allows you to, to, to understand that that's you in the mirror. So humans, I claim, are either identifying with a thinker only or a thinker plus doer. And then there's, if you, when you get into enough meditation, there'll be thinker, doer, and experiencer in the, in the human self model. Now, the head only could be Mr. Spock or me. The head plus heart could be Kirk or my wife. And, and this would be the Dalai Lama over here. Well, this wouldn't be him. He'd, he'd have more experience than that. So another, another kind of consciousness that I'm going to look at is flow state consciousness. And I claim that flow state consciousness has a dominant experiencer. And one of the reasons is that one of the aspects of flow state consciousness is that you, you lose self-awareness, your self-consciousness. And, and the experiencer-dominated consciousness all had the selfless awareness. So if you're not experiencing a self there, that must be mostly the experience or self, experience or consciousness that you are. The other, the, another one is that there's an intense concentration on the now. That's what the experiencer does all, all the time. It is always taking the current sensory input and updating the model of the world. It's the thinker that's off in the past or the future. And finally, there's emerging of action and awareness. That would be the experiencer and the doer, emerging of those two together. That'd be like an, an athlete in the middle of yes, the game. Yes, athletes or, or artists, you know, any of those kinds of things. They get into the flow state, yes. Now, I'm going to talk about enlightenment later, but let me just put in a, a, a short definition here. I think that enlightenment is like the flow state, but it's persistent. You know, the flow state is something you get in and then you get out of that for an hour or however long you're in the flow state. The idea here is for the enlightened states, it's supposed to last for a long time. And again, they have a selfless awareness and that sense of presence that comes also from the experiencer. And there's no sense of agency because the experiencer doesn't have any agency in the world. It's a thinker and doer that do things in the world. So there are multiple stages of enlightenment here. There could be less thinker, no thinker, or 100% experiencer. And that, that could be the experiencer here. So it's clear that there is not just a discrete number of stages of, of, of kinds of consciousness. There's a continuum of kinds of consciousness. And if you think of this triangle here having the three different axes for the thinker, doer, and experiencer consciousness going from zero to 100%, then every point inside this, rec inside this triangle is a different kind of consciousness. So for example, the human might be there, the animal might be over there, the flow state might be there, and the, the enlightened state might be there. 
And this is not a static model. It's a dynamic model. For example, you go from a thinker consciousness in your normal state, and then you get into the flow state, and it goes up into the experiencer there, spend some time in the experiencer, and then goes back down into the thinker consciousness. So this is dynamic. It moves around. Now, there was a question of what kind of consciousness do you get if you eliminate one of the agents? If you eliminate the experiencer, you end up with unconsciousness because you're not going to experience any sensory input. You won't have any experience of the world out there. And the thinker and doer also wouldn't be able to do anything because they need to have a world model in order to operate. Now, if you eliminate the doer, then you have what's equivalent to locked-in syndrome. You can experience the world. You can even experience your thoughts about the world. You can think about the world, but you can't move the body. And there are some unfortunate people that have enough neurological damage where they can't move the body and they have locked-in syndrome. So that would be locked-in syndrome. For a long time, I didn't know what the thinker, no thinker would be. And this summer, I read a whole bunch of papers about this obscure neuro neurological syndrome called autoactivation deficit. And I think that autoactivation deficit is what you get when you don't have a thinker. So let's talk about that for a bit here. Now, this is a particular form of a general category of neurological syndromes that are known as apathy. There can be all kinds of kinds of apathy that can develop based on some neuro, neuro damage. And there's, there's a, in the literature, there's a number of different names for this syndrome here, but they're all the same. And the, what, this is usually caused by bilateral focal lesions to very specific small little parts of the, the basal ganglia. So if you have too much damage, you're going to have a lot of neurological defects. You won't be able to move your body around or you'll have spasticity or you know, all kinds of neurological defects. But these people don't seem to have neurological defects. The, um, and it has to be bilateral to get that to happen. There are basically three symptoms that come with autoactivation deficit. And, and I'm going to talk about each of these symptoms in order. So in psychokinesis, this means that the AED patients don't spontaneously move or talk. They can sit in a chair for hours and hours and hours, not saying anything, not doing anything. The most surprising thing about this condition, though, is that this inertia is easily reversed if somebody tells them to do something or if you ask them a question. If you ask them a question, they'll answer it. If you tell them to get up and make your bed, they'll get up and make their bed, but they won't do anything spontaneously. So some examples of that. There was an AAD patient that was asked by his son to mow the lawn. So he got the lawnmower out and he got onto the lawn and he must have gotten distracted at that point because he stood there on the lawn for 45 minutes with his hands on the lawnmower, not moving. When the son finally noticed it, he said, move. And that was all it took for, to get the, the dad to move and to mow the lawn and put the lawnmower away. Another example is a patient sat on his bed with an unlit cigarette for about 30 minutes. When somebody asked him, what are you doing? He said, I'm waiting for a light. A patient, even though he would sit for hours, he could play bridge if asked to play bridge. And this really surprised me. I thought you would need a thinker to play bridge. But apparently, if you're a very experienced bridge player, the intuition is enough to figure out what bid you should make and what card you should play. So the intuition and the experiencer, the experiencer and doer working together can play bridge without a thinker. And then a patient, the, the wife reported that the patient would starve to death if I didn't tell him to eat. So they don't even eat unless they're told to eat. Now turning to mental emptiness, patient, AED patients report no thoughts, no projections in the future. Now this is not a 100% syndrome. There are AED patients that have this 100%. They report no thoughts, no act, not, not at all going on there. But then there are other ones that have just reduced thoughts, thoughts, and some seem to have like normal levels of thoughts. The weird thing is, if you ask the ones that have thoughts, why aren't you moving, they don't have an answer to that question. They don't know why they aren't moving. They're just thinking, but they're not moving. And, and this is expressed, for example, one patient said, no, I'm just thinking of nothing, no idea, no question, no thought at all. Another one reported that it's, it's a blank in my mind. There's no thought going on there. Now on to the blunted affect. Now, these patients do have emotions, but they're reduced emotions, and they don't last very long. One patient, for example, sincerely cried about a death, but then forgot about it. When asked later, what's going on in your life, he talked about the political events going on. He didn't talk about the death that had just occurred. Another patient report what was taking neuropsychological tests, and when she was told if she had passed or failed the test, she was briefly pleased or, or sad but then it quickly dissipated and went on. And then the, a patient that was talking about the death of her nephew, nephew she said, it was tragic, but now, really, now it's really not such a big deal. 
So she's aware that there was a difference reaction when she didn't have this, this condition. She reacted differently to the death of the nephew than she reacts now. She could see that there was a difference there, but it's just not such a big deal now. Now, how is the, uh, the, the disabled thinker explain the psychic akinesis? Basically, the problem that the thinker would solve is, what should I do or say now? So if there is no thinker, it's not going to solve that problem, and the doer is just going to sit there patiently waiting for some thinker to tell it what to do. And the other thing, if you're not doing or saying anything right now, you certainly can think about something right now, and these patients that don't think apparently don't have that solution there to that problem. That's why there's a report of no thoughts. Now, how, how, the, the way that the disabled thinker explains this is that when, when, the, when the patient is requested to do something, or if you ask them a question, the doer treats that request from the ex, external person as if it came from the absent thinker, and that's why the doer is able to do whatever it's told to do. So it's using the external person and replace, replacement for the thinker that's not there. And surprisingly, the doer can perform things like mowing lawns and play bridge all by itself. Now, how is the blunted affect explained? The sadness of the nephew's death that we talked about before, that was experienced by the doer and experiencer. But normally, the thinker would amplify and prolong this feeling by thinking things like, oh, this is terrible. My poor sister, how is she going to handle this? Why did he have to die? What a terrible disease. He had such a bright future. Each of these questions here are a problem that the thinker is trying to solve, and there is no solution to these problems. So the obsessing about this death over and over again is what causes the devastation of the nephew's death before the patient had the AAD syndrome. And if, if the, without this amplification, the sadness just quickly dissipates. It's experienced, but then it dissipates. That's not such a big deal. Wait, now, yes? Aren't you like taking your own bias and interpreting that? How do you know if that's really going on with that patient? Is that... This is a hypothesis. Okay. This is a hypothesis. But it explains, explains everything I know about AAD syndrome. And how is it normally explained? How have it explained before you came along with this triple uh, thing of thinker doer experience? Uh, well, you can read the literature. I, I, they talk about lack of motivation. Somehow, the motivation circuit in the brain got disabled by that damage. That's that's what most neurologists neuro, neurologists say. I don't know. It's, it seems kind of ad hoc. This might be ad hoc too. But let me go on. There are two other studies about AAD I want to talk about. The first one looked at dreaming in AAD patients, and the um, compared to controls. AAD patients do dream, but they dream shorter dreams. They're less frequent dreams, less bizarre, and less complex. Now, this paper goes on and talks about there are two hypotheses in the dream business. Is, is, are dreams caused by top-down activation or by bottom-up activation? Top-down would be from the higher level brain. The, the bottom-up would be from the sensory areas of the brain. And the fact that these AAD patients can continue to dream, this paper claims that this is evidence for the bottom-up activation of dreams. So dreams start in the experiencer and, and, and not the thinker. The thinker would be the top-down activation. If a thinker were active while you're dreaming, the, the thinker would have to solve the problem of making sense of the dream. That's what causes this to give you a longer, more bizarre, and more complex dream. So if you have a thinker, you're going to have a longer, more complex, and bizarre, bizarre dream. Okay, and then the other paper that I'll talk about is, is its title was Disconnecting Force from Money. And they used three different groups of agents. They had controls, they had AAD patients, and they had Parkinson's patients. Now, the reason they chose Parkinson's patients is that they also have damage to the basal ganglia. The, the Parkinson's comes from a basal ganglia disease. And they also have a form of apathy. So Parkinson's has apathy, AAD has apathy. And they were given two different kind of tasks. They were given a, a handle that could measure grip strength. And there were two tasks. There was the instructed task where they were instructed to try to pull the handle, squeeze the handle until it got to the requested value, the 40, 60, 80. And then the other one was an incentive task where they were given an incentive either $1 or one, these are all euros, 1 euro, 10 euros, or 50 euros. And they were told that the harder they squeeze, the more of that money they'll get. So there were two things that were measured. They measured the grip force and they measured the skin conductance. When, the, when you look at the, the three groups on the instructed task, they were all able to complete the task. They could all uh, change, the, change the force that they were using on the, grip, on the handle to match whatever the experiments were asking them. But on the, on the incentive task, the AAD patients 
didn't change their modulation, didn't change how hard they squeezed, whether it was a $1 reward or a 50, a 50 euro reward, one euro or 50 euros. Does that be the one called the NS in the middle? It's non-significant. NS means non-significant. Oh. So th these are significant that, that the lines are going up here, that's what the star means. NS means not significant. There isn't any. Oh, oh, I see from the top, sorry. Yeah. And then the other thing is that it, when, from the skin conductance, you could see that all three groups had a larger reaction to the 50 euro test. They all had a higher skin conductance in the 50 euro test here. There is a blunted affect in, the, in, the, in the two, these two groups of patients, the AED patients and the Parkinson's patients. So the thinkers in these guys must be more active in ma making them squeeze harder for the 50 euros. Now, a disabled thinker explains this disconnecting force from money. For example, in the instructed task, the doer all by itself can get to the red line here that's been requested. So it can get to that value by changing how hard it strains, how hard it pulls. So it's able to do that. But for the incentive task, they were told that the harder you squeeze, the more money you're going to get. But the only information they have is this picture here, which is that's a 50 euro node, apparently. And then they got the range from 0 to 50. But the doer doesn't figure out that, oh, if I squeeze harder, I'm going to get more of that $50, 50 euros. In order to solve that problem, they would have to get the thinker, and the thinker would be the one that would tell the doer to squeeze harder in the, in the 50 euro test. So what are the lessons from AED that I've learned here? First of all, it's surprising how little the thinker is used. I mean, you can actually live most of life if you just had someone telling you what to do at every minute. You know, you don't need a thinker to solve problems or anything like that. You can just have someone tell you what to do. And I consider this AD, uh, AD syndrome as more evidence for the three-agent three, three model. I think it explains it so well. I think this is, can, can be considered as more evidence. And then finally, there are some similarities between AAD and enlightenment. For example, in enlightenment, you're supposed to let go of your attachments and aversions. And that's what these patients do with that blunted affect. The blunted affect is letting go of attachments and aversions. Now, there are some testable predictions that come out of this AAD patient. First of all, I predict that an AED patient would have a hard time learning a new game like bridge. They can, they can play a, a game that they're very experienced with because they've got intuition about that, but I think you need a thinker to start to learn how to break bridge in the first place. You've got to use your thinker a lot there. The other thing is the way, that, the way that psychologists test for dual process theory is they give you a multiple choice test and they design the test so that the intuitive answer, the, what seems like the intuitively correct answer, is the wrong answer. And it turns out that 85% of people who take this test choose the wrong intuitive answer because they don't use their thinker. It takes effort to use your thinker to figure out what the right answer is. Then 15% use the thinker and, and figure out the right answer. I claim that these AAD patients would never give you the correct answer if they have a disabled thinker. So, so I, if, I think if you gave these AAD patients, now I, I think there's only like 50 of these in the whole world. I don't know how we're going to perform this experiment. But I think if you could perform this experiment, they would never give you the correct answer. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about spirituality in the last 12 minutes here. I think I can almost cover it. First of all, to explain spirituality, I have to define spirituality, and I have an equation for that. Okay. Now, dogma would be, for example, any book that says every word of this book is true. You have to subtract that from religion, and what's left there is spirituality. Somebody also suggested you should subtract politics. An example of politics is proselytizing, trying to convert the whole world over to your religion. So you take those two away from religion, what would be left would be spirituality. Now, a positive definition of spirituality would be that spirituality is what you get when you, when you perform the kind of practice that spirituality uses, like all these practices here. And I'll go through each one of these in turn. Now, my hypothesis is that spirituality developed somewhere between 40,000 and 100,000 years ago when human consciousness changed. The reason for those two numbers is that at 100,000 years ago, we started for the first time to bury our dead, and we bury them with grave goods. So at about 100,000 years ago is where humans first had the idea that there was some kind of a life after death. So that's one indication. At 40,000 years ago is when we started to um, carve figurines that could represent a fertility goddess. So there we had a concept of an abstract goddess or, or a god of, of some kind. So somewhere in that range is where, where um, I think spirituality developed. And the, the reason why consciousness changed is because of modern language. Now my model is that if you look at, at chimpanzees in the wild right now, they have something like 30 to maybe 100 call signs. And some of these are verbal call signs. Some of them are gestures. So six million years ago, when the last common ancestor with the great apes of humans was around, they probably had something like 30, 30 to 100 call signs or 30 to 100 words. 
Right now, modern English has a half a million words. That's a huge increase in the vocabulary that occurred in the six million years. And it probably happened gradually over a period of time. You know, it took a long time initially to go from one discovery to the discovery of fire to the discovery of a better way of making a bow and things like that. So there was a gradual increase of the vocabulary. And I claim that by 100,000 years ago, we could probably create a conceptual model of the entire sensory world. We could come up with a number, enough words that we could describe anything that was happening out in the world in language. And that's, I think, when we, when we, be, when we became an I, me, my concept, when the thinker became the dominant agent in these, in these early humans. And then after that happened, the next thing that happens is that we actually developed an even more complex world, an abstract world with a lot of abstract concepts in it. And that's when things like the God concept would have, would have arisen. Because that's where, it's a, it's a completely abstract concept. You can't put your hand on God and, and feel it. It's a concept that you've created in your brain. So that's where I think spirituality came from that. And what, who we are changed when that happened. We started, ancient humans would have identified with the doer. And modern humans would identify with the thinker. And that caused the problem. And the problem is the thinker. Now, the thinker is great for doing science and, and having civilization. You know, all the stuff that you see around you in this room here is all the result of, of the thinker being active in humans here for, for the last 50,000 years. But it's not good at living a happy life. The problem is that to a hammer, everything is a nail. To a problem solver, everything is a problem. That means if there is no problem, then that's a problem. I've got to find a problem to solve. <laughs> And if I can't find a problem to solve by criticizing something that's happening right here, right now, I'll go off and find a problem to solve in the past. And that's usually a resentment that I have against somebody in the past. Or I'll go off into the future and try to solve a problem, and that usually causes a fear because there's some kind of a problem I can't solve in the future. So all those negative emotions of resentment and fear come from this thinker trying to solve problems in the past and future. My meditation teacher called that rehashing and rehearsing. So he was rehashing the past and rehearsing the future. The other way you can think about it is that you're having conversations with people who are not in the room. You're trying to figure out what you wish you had said to that person back there or what you're going to say to that person the next time you see them. So that's what the thinker does. And it argues with reality. It says, this should not happen. Now, you have a, a contradictory world model here if your language model says that this should not happen and your sensory model says that this did happen. That's not a, that's not a good kind of a world model to have. Negative emotions are a problem for the thinker to solve. How do I make sure this never happens again? You know, my girlfriend broke up with me. How do I make sure the next girlfriend is never going to break up with me? I've got to solve that problem. Positive emotions are a problem for the thinker to solve. You know, my wife loves me. How do I make sure that she's going to love me forever? I've got to solve that problem. And the thinker can turn a positive emotion into a negative emotion of fear. What will happen if my wife leaves me? Now, spirituality fixes this thinker problem. And the spirituality can either be theistic or non-theistic. The non-theistic traditions include things like Tibetan Buddhism or Taoism. Theistic religions would be you know, Christianity, Judaism. And my, my, my hypothesis is that theis, the theistic religions developed around 40,000 years ago when the thinker was not as, not as dominant as it is today. It, it's not, it didn't have as much vocabulary as we have today. It hasn't been trained to think as well as we think today. And at that time, a weaker thinker could have experienced a more powerful experiencer or doer agent active in its life. And it might have identified that experiencer or doer as the God concept. So that could be one, one way that it developed. In fact, if you think about God is usually claimed to be the, per, the, the entity that created the world, the experiencer creates the world that we live in. So it's true that God created the world if God is the experiencer. And for example, the, the story about Adam and Eve with the Garden of Eden they, they were living in paradise before the thinker became the dominant agent. And when they took the bite of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that's when the thinker became the dominant agent. And then they were cast out in, into suffering in the world. Yes? So just to clarify, do you have a naturalistic, psychological interpretation of all of spirituality? Or do you actually believe in like something metaphysical or something that's supernatural? No, I absolutely do not believe in supernatural. I am a physicist. This is all naturalistic model of the world, materialistic model of the world. This is a materialistic model of spirituality. And, and I, I, in fact, I would call myself a spiritual atheist, if you want to know what I would call myself. So yeah, I don't believe in, that there's a God that created the universe or 
that I don't believe that consciousness is non-physical. That's why I tried to convince you here for the last hour and 25 minutes, is that consciousness is a physical property of the brain. Did you yes. say it is or it's not? I'm it sorry. is a physical property of the brain. All right, so that's where I think the, the theistic religions came from, um, that belief that there was something more powerful than the thinker. Now, how do spiritual practices fix the thinker problem? Well, meditation is where you're trying to pay attention to your awareness of objects, the awareness of your meditation object, whatever it is. And the major barrier to meditation is that thinker, the thinker coming in and, and asking you to make the grocery list of what you're going to shop when you leave here, or what you should do about this problem there, or that problem here. So part of the meditation practice is to first of all notice when the thinker interrupts, and then to, to just gently ask the thinker to please let that go and let me get back to my practice. So this is giving you practice and letting go of the thinker's demands. Surrender is where the thinker gives up. I can't solve everything in the world. I have to, I have to rely on uh, other, another solution to this. And prayer is where the thinker is explicitly asking the God, the experiencer, for help. Living in the now is what the experiencer does all the time, and the thinker is often the past or the future. So if you can live in the now, you're not living in the thinker consciousness. Now, forgiveness is the antidote for resentment caused by the thinker living in the past. And the best uh, forgiveness saying I've ever heard is that forgiveness is giving up all hope of a better past. And as long as I'm holding on to the, the hope that I can go back and change the past, past and you know, get that guy to apologize to me for what he did, good. I'm going to hold on to the resentment. If I can accept that the past is unchangeable and it's just the way it is, then I can forgive, I can forgive and just go on with living life instead of holding on to the resentment. And acceptance is accepting the world the way it is right now. Uh, the guru, Krishnamurti, was asked by one of his disciples, how, how, do you, how did you get enlightened? How do you get enlightened? And he said, you see... I don't mind what happens. Now that's exactly what the experiencer does all the time. The experiencer takes information in from the world and it updates the world model. It doesn't care you know, if this is good or bad. It doesn't make any judgments like that. It's the thinker that makes the judgments about what's, what's good and bad. Trust is what is, is, an, is gonna mitigate the fear caused by the, the, the thinker trying to solve problems in the future. If you can just trust that the future is gonna work out okay. And gratitude is the antidote for the negative critical attitude towards life that the thinker generates. And then, and then how does the human self-model change with spiritual practices? Well, we kind of went through this before. The ancient human would have been a doer dominated. The modern human would be thinker dominated. And in the modern human, the thinker takes all the credit for everything that the human does, even though the doer and the experiencer do most of the work of living. And in this modern spiritual human, there's a significant amount of the experiencer, experiencer self-model built in there. In fact, for the theistic spiritual traditions, I believe the experiencer is the connection of the feeling of a connection to God. For example, a lot of the, spirit, the theistic traditions say that if you're asking for what God's will is for you, just ask God and then wait for that intuitive thought to come. And when that intuitive thought comes, that's God telling you what to do. Well, the intuitive thought comes from the experiencer. So that's why I think that the experiencer is the feeling of the connection to God, and, and in fact, it is the God. So if you look at a list of the spiritual virtues and spiritual vi vices, all of the spiritual virtues make social situations go more smoothly. All of the spiritual vices cause friction in, in social situations, and the spiritual vices are all, also selfish and self-centered. So it's the selfishness and self-centeredness that causes that, and it's the ego, it's the thinker that is the selfish and self-centered agent. The doer is the pro-social agent, is the agent that has all the social wills built in, so it's able to do, live the spiritual virtues much better than the, than the thinker is. Now, these, the people that have theistic religions claim that God can help them. And for example, in Alcoholics Anonymous, that's a, a, a theistic spiritual tradition, and they claim that God can help me to not drink. So how can that be true according to my model here? Well, the, first of all, let me describe what I think of as the addiction model. If we take, take Fred for an example, Fred learns that when he's in high school, if he drinks at a party, he's happier. He has a more fun, you know, he's, he's, he's the life of the party. He doesn't feel self-conscious. And um, let me take a drink here. So he, he's the life of the party when he drinks in the party. And that's going so well that he drinks when he's not at parties too. And he ends up drinking a lot. Now, the doer, can, the doer can copy that goal of drinking, 
So even on a day where, the, where Fred says, I'm not going to drink today, if somebody puts that beer down near him, the doer is going to pick up that beer and drink it before Fred's even aware of it. So you have a strong goal to drink, both in the thinker and the doer. Now, maybe the negative consequences finally become apparent, like maybe there's a DUI or their girlfriend threatens to leave him. So Fr Fred makes this goal of, I'm going to stop drinking. But he ends up drinking every time because this, the thinker and the doer goals are more powerful. So that's my model of addiction. And when, when Fred comes into AA, the first thing they ask him to do is to surrender. Admit that you're powerless over alcohol. You cannot handle the alcohol yourself. And then to ask your God for help. And in this case, I think what's happening is they're essentially asking the experiencer for help. Now, this is what triggers the wise intuitive attention mechanism. The experiencer notices that Fred has these powerful goals to, to drink in both the thinker and the doer. He also has a thinker goal of not drinking. And the thinker has also declared that he can't handle it himself. And that the thinker is asking the experiencer for help. So when, when that condition is noticed by the experiencer, it uses its wise intuition to figure out that if I paid less attention to alcohol, that would help, thinker, help, help Fred meet his goal. So the, the thinker turns down the attention knob for anything that has, that's related to alcohol. So for example, if somebody puts a, deer, a beer down next to him, maybe the experiencer doesn't bring that to the attention of the doer, so the doer doesn't go over and pick it up and drink it. Or when Fred has a fight with his girlfriend and he starts obsessing about drinking, you know, that'll solve the problem. When those thought, the obsessive thoughts about drinking occur in the, in the thinker, the experiencer will turn down the attention knob on, on those thoughts. And when you turn down the attention knob on thoughts, the thoughts dissipate more quickly. If you turn up the attention knob on thoughts, they're going to persist and you'll, and you'll end up eventually drinking because you're going to be obsessing about drinking over and over and over again. So this is my model where the experiencer can help the alcoholic overcome alcoholism by turning down the attention knob for alcohol. And the same thing had happened for any other cause of suffering. For example, the Buddhists talk about suffering com coming from attachments and aversions. So if you turn down the, the, the attention knob for attachments and aversions, that could help with that suffering too. Now to, in about minus three minutes here, let's talk about spiritual enlightenment. So the first question is, what is it? Well, it's not anything about perfection. And my source here is a, is a book by uh, Dan Daniel Ingram. It's called Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha. And in that book, he has a chapter where he has 31 models of enlightenment that have been proposed by various spiritual traditions. And a lot of these models have to do with perfection in one way or another. Perfect actions, perfect thought, perfect speech. And he rejects all those perfection models. In fact, the only model that he doesn't reject is the non-duality model. So, so Daniel Ingram claims that enlightenment is about non-duality. Non-duality is the English translation of the Sanskrit word Advaita, which means not to. And this is the, the realization that there's no self-other distinction and there's no object, subject object distinction. And, and you notice that non-duality is what happens when you're in the experiencer consciousness state. The experiencer consciousness is a selfless awareness of the world. There's no self in the experiencer consciousness. So you would be in a non-dual state if you were in the experiencer consciousness. The other thing is that he reports that there are anywhere from 2 to 12 12 stages of enlightenment and all these. He surveyed all the various Buddhist traditions and there's lots of them. He surveyed them all and there's anywhere from 2 to 12 stages of enlightenment. So there's not a single one-pointed enlightenment that you have to get to this state right here to be enlightened. And if you're not there, you're not enlightened. It's a broad range. It's that upper triangle of the, of the, the triangle. And then the... Um, in terms of trainings, that Buddhism has four trainings. The first training is a training in morality. This is basically to do the spiritual virtue things and to not do the spiritual vices. Then there's a training in concentration. This is so that you can do your meditation practice successfully. You train your concentration. Then there's insights, and there's three different insights that I'll talk about in just a minute. And then the fourth training is more morality, because even though you've achieved enlightenment with, your, with enlightenment with your insights, you still need more training in morality because you're not perfect. Now, the insights that Buddhism claims are impermanence, that everything changes, and that the, the life is suffering. And the suffering comes from attachments and aversions, and that's the reason why we suffer in life. And remember, those attachments and aversions are from the thinker amplifying the attachments and aversions. And then there's the no-self insight that you get from, from Buddhism, and that's the non-dual insight. Now, let's look at the Hindu Advaita Vedanta tradition. And this is actually a very complicated school of philosophy and religious practice. It's very elaborate. 
But the, the, main, the main insight that they get is the non-dual insight. And they express this by saying Atman equals Brahman. Atman is supposed to be the true soul of the human, and Brahman is all of reality. So they're saying that the true soul of the human is all of reality. And my model here, the true soul of the human is the experience or world model, and all of reality is the experience or world model. So that's the non-dual, non-dual insight here. There's no subject out that distinction. Oops, I couldn't hear you that last. The, in, in, my, in my interpretation of this Atman equals Brahman is the Atman is the experiencer, the experiencer's world model. That's the true soul of the human is the experiencer's fundamental consciousness. And Brahman is all of reality. So that's how these two are the same. Now, the, the Hindu sage Ramana Maharishi said that the fastest way to enlightenment is through the self-inquiry method. So a lot of, of um, modern Western non-dual teachers have embraced that. And the self-inquiry method is where you're continually asking, who am I? And if you come up with the ego, no, that's not the answer. That's, the, that's also known as the thinker. I'm not the body. That's also known as the doer. And there's a non-dual teacher named John Wheeler, and this is not the physicist John Wheeler. And he wrote a book where the title of the book is the answer to the question of who am I? And the title of the book is Presence Awareness, Just This and Nothing Else. So the answer to who am I is Presence Awareness. Now, the, as we showed before, you know, there's the, the flow state and then the early enlightenment. And I drew this a little differently here because I'm trying to emphasize that you, rec- you come to recognize that even though there's still some identification with the thinker and some identification with the doer, you're experiencing the thinker and doer as being in the world of experience of the experiencer. They're included in the world. They're not separate from the world. And then in the fully enlightened state, there would be no identification with the thinker or doer, but you still experience the thinker's voice in your head and you still experience the doer's emotions. Now, if you look at the thinker, doer, and experiencer consciousness, it's only the experiencer consciousness that, that matches all these insights of all these different traditions because that's the only selfless awareness. Now, can this model help attain enlightenment? Well, first of all, this model provides a cognitive framework to understand what enlightenment is and to understand how to achieve enlightenment and to assess the efficacy of proposed practices. So you can look at the different traditions, what practices they recommend for achieving enlightenment, and you can see if it makes sense from this model's point of view. Does it make sense to do that? Or maybe this one makes more sense to do. Further, This framework clarifies that the experiencer's fundamental consciousness is who we are. It's recognizing that we are that fundamental consciousness. That is what the enlightened state is. And that's what I say here. The the experiences from the proposed practices that that these traditions recommend, plus the intellectual understanding of this framework, may be able to lead you more directly to the transformed human self-model identification, which is enlightenment. So it's enlightenment is experiencing that who we are is fundamental consciousness. And notice, unfortunately, it has to come from experience. The self-model is only changed by the experiencer by experiencing that the self-model is the fundamental consciousness. Now, just as a reminder, this is the fundamental consciousness I'm talking about there. It's the experiencer's world model awareness plus the experiencer's selfless object awareness. Finally, we get to the philosophical questions. Here's the end. So, First of all, I'm going to answer these philosophical questions about fundamental consciousness. That's what I'm going to talk about here. So the first question is, why does conscious awareness seem to be fundamentally non-physical and to not have a location in space? Well, both the attention schema and the experience or attention schema are completely abstract concepts, which means that they're non-physical and they don't have a location in space. And attention schema theory says that those things are awareness. And therefore, fundamental conscious awareness seems to be non-physical and have to know location in space. Now, this is not my original uh, argument. This is actually Michael Graziano's argument when he talks about attention schema theory. He explains that since the attention schema is an abstract concept, that's why it seems like consciousness is non-physical. The next question is, what conditions cause conscious awareness to arise? Well, the fundamental conscious awareness requires that you have an agent that's making a model of the world, and the agent is also directing both top-down and bottom-up attention. And the agent has an attention schema and experiencer's attention schema. And the attention schema then says that this agent has fundamental consciousness. So that's what's required for consciousness, conscious awareness to arise. And then can conscious awareness exist without a self? Well, yes, fundamental consciousness is selfless awareness. And finally, do humans have free will? Well, fundamental consciousness comes from the experiencer. 
And if we are this consciousness, then we don't do anything in the external world. Only the thinker and doer do things. The thinker and the doer are the agents that make decisions in the world. We just create a model of the world as fundamental consciousness. And therefore, as fundamental consciousnesses, we don't have free will. I think most people who think that we have free will think that somehow consciousness is making the decision. And this just shows you that consciousness is going on for the ride of whatever the thinker and doer are doing. So I guess I fall into the compatibilist camp of, of um, free will. I believe you should act as if you should have free will. and We should have laws that punish people for doing wrong things. But the purpose of those laws is to get those people to change their goals. They've, they've got too many selfish and self-centered goals, and we're trying to uh, punish them so that they change them to have more selfless awareness, selfless goals. So I hope that your experience or intuitively understood this explanation of multiple forms of conscious awareness. And I'd like to thank you for directing your top-down attention to my presentation. Here's the bibliography. And I invite you to come and check out my website. And if you sign up now on the website, I will send you a very occasional emails when I have new content on the website, such as when this talk gets put up on the website. And I'll also send you a notification when I finally publish the book. So thank you for your help here.